been through divorce or you know broken relationships, that's going to make it heal. It could be some things from your past that's hindering you from moving forward. And so in that area, so whatever it is that God has, he's brought you here, and he's going to do some things. Glory. And so the schedule is tonight, we're just going to teach tonight, I'm laying the foundation. And in the morning at 10, we will be back, and we will break, we have a lunch for you, wonderful lunch that we uh, are preparing, and then we will come back at 1 for the last session, and we will teach and go in, and we're going to do cleansing on marriages, on everybody, whoever comes, and so God wants to deal with some things in our hearts that that are hindering us, and um, so you might hear some things that you've heard before concerning marriage, and you might uh, hear some new things, and you might hear some things that you don't like, <laughs> but you know what, take it to Jesus, amen? <laughs> Because what we do is we walk the word. And so the Lord instructed me to go back to the beginning. Amen. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to his original intent for marriage. Amen. Yes. His original design. Not what tradition Amen. says. Hello. Amen. Not any of that. But what God said and what, how, what he intended uh, in the beginning. And so even after we're done tonight. I will make some decrees and, and do some things, and there's a couple things I'll have you do be, when you uh, go home and before you come back to some things, some areas you need to uh, look at in your own heart concerning uh, your spouse and yourself. You know, because when you look at your spouse, you're looking at yourself, really. And so there's some things that God wants to, to reveal to you, okay? And so God is going to do it. Amen. He's going to do it, right? Amen. And so, Father, we just thank you. Father God, for this night, we just bless you tonight. And, Father God, we honor you in this place. And, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just speak through these lips of clay tonight, Father God. A word, Lord God, that would uh, equip your people, Father God. A word that would transform us, Father. A word, a, a spirit of revelation. We just invite you to come, Holy Spirit. That you would reveal to the hearts of your people the areas that they need uh, heal, the areas that they need some freedom, the areas that they need some revelation. Father, we all need revelation. And Jesus, you are the revelator. Yes. And so you are Lord and you are king of this house. And we thank you that you are the Lord. And so, Father, I just, even now, Father God, I just command ears to be open in the name of Jesus. Father, that their spiritual ears can hear tonight what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to them personally in the name of Jesus. That their spiritual eyes are even now being enlightened and opened in the name of Jesus. And I bind every distraction in the name of Jesus. I bind it right now in Jesus' name. And so, Father God, I bind the spirit of religion that hates the kingdom teaching on marriage. And so we bind you in the name of Jesus. We bind pride in the name of Jesus. Father, we bind traditions of men in the name of Jesus right now. We bind it and even fear in Jesus' name. And so those things will not speak or hinder to the hearts of the people. Their ears are now open to hear what you have to say concerning their life in their marriage, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that, and we ask that you would release ministering angels in this conference, Father, even now. Let your angels come. Let them minister, Father, to the hearts of the people, even now, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, and we just declare your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in this place. And Father, I thank you for healed bodies, Father, we don't just want healed emotions, Father. We want to see physical healings manifest. Father, we want to see, Father God, uh, blind eyes open, ears unstopped, Father. We want to see uh, your hand move this weekend in a mighty way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Genesis chapter 1. So we're going to go back to the beginning. And so we must understand... The origin of marriage as God designed it. And we got to fight to protect it and to preserve it today. Amen. Have you
been married 31 years to a wonderful man of God. Amen. His name is George. <laughs> and he'll come up later, but yeah, what a blessing. What a blessing to my life. I didn't always know what a blessing he was, okay? I had to learn what a blessing he was. But I know now that he's a blessing. And so, you know, you learn some things through the years. And so even as I teach the word, I just I just I just ask Holy Spirit just to reveal whatever and, and release whatever he wants to release that will help you. Um, in Jesus' name. And so we do have six uh, wonderful children, you know, and our youngest is uh, at home. She just turned 18. But all of our sons, they're grown, and what a blessing, you know? We thank God. We thank God for our blessings. And so when you're talking about marriage, you're talking about today, you know, it, marriage is under attack. And you all know it, that it is under major fire. And so some of the things that God was speaking to me is that we need to model it to the world as believers. They, they need to see, the world needs to see the kingdom marriages rise up. Amen? Amen. They need to see it as God intended it. And so even today, um, stats say that 49.7% marry or unmarried. And in 1930, there was 83% that got married. Think about the change, the decline in marriages today. And so we needed, we needed to rise back up, right, the way God intended it. And we know there's the homosexual agenda. There's so many things that are attacking uh, marriage today. And tomorrow we will teach about um, Jezebel. We'll go a little deeper into some strongholds and structures. But tonight is Foundation Night. And so God designed marriage as the foundational element of all human society, all right? And we're going to read the word and walk the word and talk about it. So before there was a church, before there was a business, before there was anything, there was what? Marriage in the garden. God created it. And so um, he, Adam prophesied that a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and two shall become one flesh. And so if we destroy the sanctity of marriage, you will destroy a society and a nation. And so you wonder why the enemy is after marriage. He hates it. And so he's been out to destroy it and to abolish it. And so today many even feel, well, what's, what's the point of it? We don't need marriage. We, don't, we can just shack up or we can just live together. We don't need all of that. But, but God had a plan and he had a design. And so any time that we take God out of his plan, you're going to have dysfunction and disaster. Amen? Amen? It can't function according to God's perfection. And so we're, we're believing that God is going to heal and restore marriages and release truth and revelation uh, to the church concerning marriage. Amen? Amen? And so the attack today on marriage is an attack on the society and on God himself and all that he built society on. And so it's an attack on the household of the family. And so societies are made of households, right? Mm -hmm. And so the church, the foundation of the church should be strong marriages. Mm -hmm. Should be, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need that in the house of the Lord, don't we? We need to model it. We need to um, see it happen. So in Genesis chapter 1, let's go to the word. See where he wants to go today. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 26. We know that God created the heaven and the earth and all of that. The first five chapters of Genesis are so powerful. There's so, many, so much in there. And so if we go after God created, let's go to 26. After he created the heaven and the earth and the and the, and the beasts, it says, of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it 
and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be yours for food. And so he goes on, he continues to give instructions. But what I want you to see is that God said he was going to make man in his image, male and female. He created them. And so when God created man and woman in the beginning, he created them with a purpose and a function to work together. And so there was a powerful unity in the beginning of oneness. All right? And so oneness is what we need today in marriage. Amen. There's a power of agreement. There's a plan and a purpose of God about oneness. But when you have people that are fractured and broken mm -hmm, with all of this, and we teach bloodline of cleansing and all of that, so when you have two people that come together with their baggage and with all their issues and all their uh, struggles and things going on, that person that they marry is not going to take that struggle away. It's not going to happen. That person cannot heal you. That person cannot fulfill you. So we've been taught a lot of things in traditional churches that I need my other half. No, you're, you need to be whole first. I wasn't taught those things, so I didn't have an understanding when I got married at 18. 18 and 20, you can imagine what that was like. <laughs> and so I was not whole, okay? George was not whole, and so we had to take our fragmented pieces and come together and try and model whatever we were taught, whatever we saw growing up. Because that's what we do. We become what we see, what we gaze upon, what we live under, whatever we're familiar with. We, we gravitate. We become like that. And we begin to try and uh, work things out. But we're so full of dysfunction ourselves that it don't work. And so by the grace of God, I'm standing here today still with my husband. Thank God, right? But sometimes it don't happen like that. And so God's going to help us restore some things. And so thank God that, you know, I think about the woman at the well. She was married five times, right? The Samaritan woman. In James chapter 4, you can read about her. And so in this society, when women were looked down upon and all those things, and they were not uh, valued, they were more like cattle than people. Let's tell the truth, right? But she was an outcast. She was called a, ha a half-breed. She was living with another man. But when Jesus came to her, you know, and he, he ministered to her, he ministered to her broken place. Okay? He didn't condemn her. See, Jesus doesn't condemn ever. And so a lot of times you see that in, especially in the religious church, where if someone's had failed marriages or, or, or divorce or all these things, you know, we put this big X on them and we mark them and we, we cast them aside that they can't do this and they can't do that. But the Bible says that when he washes us, we are made clean, right? And so, you know, this woman at the well, Jesus spoke to her and he ministered to her. And so he was touching the broken place in her to bring the answer that she was looking for. So many times people try and find an answer or try and find a healing or try and find fulfillment in a person. Yeah. And it's true. And you're not going to find it in people. George is a tremendous blessing in my life, but my wholeness has to come from Jesus. It has to. Okay? And so no one tries to fail in a marriage, do they? No. No one gets married to have a divorce. That's not even in their mind when they come together, right? And so marriage was created by God and is only successful when it honors his plan and includes his what? Presence. That's what we need. We need the plan of God for our marriage, but we need it in his presence, okay? His divine purpose, however it is that he, he has for us. So go to Genesis 2. So you see that he says he created them, male and female. He did all of that. 
He gave them an assignment together. And then in Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So now he's telling us how he did this here. He says, and, and he said, And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God calls to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out. He talks about the rivers. Let's go down to um, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of, <clears throat> of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. He said, I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. For, at, for He said, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, called, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Then he said, For this reason, you see here, he, he says, shall, He said, A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And this man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so God wanted to solve the problem of loneliness here. This was, a, this was a covenant of companionship. The man was alone. God said it was not good for him to be alone. And so he wanted him to have a companionship. And so the Bible speaks of marriage as a covenant of companionship. Out of that companionship, which Christ should be in the center, should flow everything else out of that. And so we find that many times in marriages today... Everything else is working or broken or half working, but the companionship is not there. And if, and if you be honest, maybe when you were younger, you were always taught, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. So just get married. Your first, your first love, you know, because you don't want to fall into sin. Right. And so you get married right away. And so there's a lot of things that that we weren't taught correctly about what God intended marriage to be. And so he, he wanted us to have intimacy, relationship, communion, all of these things. And so um, you think about it. I, I didn't understand that it was about having a good friend. Amen. Mm -hmm. It was about having a relationship. You know, uh, it was about communing. It was about... Uh, fun, having fun, all of these kind of things. And so, you know, God wants to restore the, the, the covenant of companionship in your life. Amen. Because I'm telling you, many times we have lost that companionship or we have been so on our own doing our own thing. We have, we have been through so many trials. You can't say that you've been in a marriage and not been in war. Right. No. Marriage is warfare. Yeah. If you tell the truth, right? It is it is warfare to be married. It is worth it, but it is warfare. The enemy is always going to attack marriage. He's always going to attack it. He did it. He he busted it up in Genesis, okay? Because of deception, and he did that, and so he's he's still doing that today. But we need a refreshing of companionship. Amen. Amen. We need to in, learn to enjoy each other's company again. Amen. Now, on this weekend, some of these things may not pertain to some of you, but some of these things will. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because everybody in here is different. Everybody has been 
through different trials and things in their marriage. You know, uh, George and I have been through, I think, every single one. <laughs> Truth. Yeah. And we're still here. Bless the Lord. And we've gone nowhere. But we've been through that. The loss of a child, finances, all of those kind of things. You know, uh, fight, warfare. Yeah. But we've persevered through it. Amen. And, and so there's still places where God is renewing us if we tell the truth. Everybody's on a journey to get, journey to get renewed in the spirit of our mind in every place. And so for God to renew some things, he has to tear down some things. He has to tear down some strongholds and some ideas and some things that we were taught, even when we were young. Things that we were taught that we believed as truth, and we began to build our relationships around false falsehood, mm -hmm. around uh, lies of the enemy. And so it happens that way. Go to verse 15. Thank God he's doing that. And what does it? The spirit of truth. And so we and so he did uh, put the man to sleep. So the man didn't have a choice, did he? <laughs> he didn't he didn't ask his permission. He didn't. He put him to sleep and pulled a rib out and fashioned a woman. The man wakes up, whoa, here is this woman. What is this? You know, she looks like me, but, yeah, but she has a womb. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say some things that some people might not like, but it's true. God created them equal. When he commissioned them in the garden, okay, he commissioned them to walk together. There was an equality for Eve to listen to the serpent and have a conversation with the serpent. And then she takes of that, and we know that, that they fell, right, back into the, the carnal, soulish realm. They shouldn't have even known they were naked. But when they fell like that, Adam wasn't there hovering over her. She was having an intelligent conversation with the serpent. And so they were, they were one in purpose of God to create, to multiply, to subdue in the earth and have dominion and have authority. She could have cut that serpent off right then, but she didn't. Okay, she had authority to deal with the serpent, but she chose not to. Mm -hmm. Think about that a minute. You know, people want to point the blame. And when God came, and it, and it says in Genesis 3, let's read about it. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. He said, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise... She took from the fruit and she ate it, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin covering. Let's think about that a minute. So here she takes it, she eats it, she gives it to her husband, he eats, he eats it too, and then their eyes were opened. And so there was a glory that was on them that lifted because of sin. There was, there was a, a, the, the covering had lifted because of sin. So they thought they could make themselves fig leaves and cover themselves. And what did God do? He says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. 
So, so here you have the first time God ever came down to them that they were hiding from God because of sin. They hid from him. They tried to cover up themselves, okay? And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave me. Gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And so Adam is saying, I didn't ask for this woman. You, you gave her to me and look what she's done, is what he's saying. And so, but God didn't, God didn't, didn't that didn't work, did it? And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and the dust you will eat in all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To thy woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, he said, you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. I want you to pay attention to the curse that came upon this first marriage. He said, then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it in all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it will grow for you. And you will eat the plants in the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread. Till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. He said, for you were dust, and to dust you shall return. And then, and then it says, the man called his name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And so you see that God pronounced this curse upon them because of sin. And so one of the curses on this, you have to see that before there was a unity, and there was a oneness, and there was a together and an equality. And so there's always going to be, under the curse, there's going to be a power struggle in a marriage. <laughs> there's going to be a power struggle. It's either going to be a struggle in the finances, or it's going to be a struggle in the sexuality. There's going to be a struggle with the kids. There's going to be a power struggle that will happen when you live underneath that. You don't have a revelation yet. Your, your, your mind is still darkened if you don't have unity in your marriage. Help us, Lord. There's a dark place in there. Amen? There's something amiss. And so all of these curses that happen, and then it goes on to say that um, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And so I want you to, to, to look at that because, remember I said they tried to cover each other, right? Well, it, it didn't work. And so God had to, had to kill an animal and put skins on them, shed blood, right? We know that um, they learned a valuable lesson there. And it says in, you know, in Hebrews that without shedding of blood, there is no what? Repentance. And so you see the first uh, part in the garden where God had to do that to, to deal with the sin that they had committed. And he covered them. Their covering couldn't work. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't what God had in mind. See, God covered them with his glory before they fell. Okay? And he still covered them after they fell. Praise God. Praise God. And so, you know, and then Adam named his wife Eve. And you can look it up in, in the Genesis 5. It says that in the beginning when God created male and female, he named them Adam. He named them humankind. They, he did not uh, change her name. So when God came into the garden and he was, he was uh, calling for Adam or walking to see Adam, it was both of them. There was a powerful oneness there. She got her identity from him from after the fall, the curse. Now, I'm not a feminist preacher, okay? I'm not like that. I'm very submitted to George. But we have, we have a oneness that we work on. 
We have an equality that we walk in, in Jesus' name. I thank God for that, that I haven't had the power struggle to be who God has called me to be. Amen. And you shouldn't either. And so when you think about, when you think about this fall, and it says in Galatians 3.13, it says that Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, right? Amen. He became the curse for us, for it's written, curse is anyone that hangs on a tree. Right. That means that Jesus, we think, when we think of a curse, we think of a sickness, or we think of this or that, or some kind of sin, but all the way back. God prophesied that he was going to send Jesus to deal with this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So God's desire is for us to allow him to be our covering in marriage. Yeah. So, I, so the Lord told me to speak about this covering thing because, you know, I was taught that too growing up. And every time I hear that, that, uh, you know, a husband will say, well, that I'm her covering, that takes away Okay, there's there's a difference when when we talk about the order of God. Okay, God made man first, right? Then he pulled the same substance out of a man, and he fashioned this woman out of the same stuff that was in the man. Okay, but he covered them. There was a covering, so the spirit of God covers us. So when I even me as I go into battle. George prays for me, and we should pray one for another. Thank God, right? He prays for me, but he can't cover me in spiritual warfare. He can't keep, he, can't, he don't have the, that power within George. Now, the Holy Spirit in him has faith. <laughs> He's back there doing muscles, but <laughs> has faith, okay? But the covering that I have is Jesus, who is the head of the what? Church. Right? And so what happens is, kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to read some of this. And so I showed you where they tried to cover themselves. And I showed you that God had to step in and say, that ain't, that ain't what, I'm, what I'm doing. I covered you before, I'm covering you afterwards. So their hearts were now darkened because of sin, disobedience to God's command. They tried to cover themselves. And so what God was speaking is man cannot cover man. And I say it like that, it sounds pretty silly, don't it? But it's, it's lingo, it's things that we were taught growing up in a lot of traditional kind of settings, okay? It's, it, we were taught these things. And so God was the covering and the guard. His glory covered them before and after. They knew nothing before they fell, but love, acceptance, purity, the innocence was stolen. And so God, the Lord God had their had uh, them covered. They sinned, and He covered them again. And so He prepared the sacrifice, even in the garden, with skins. And so until sin entered the earth, no sacrifice was needed. And so when God slayed the animal, and He did that, and then we see where Adam, when he had his sons, he taught them the proper way to bring an offering to God. And it was through what? Sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Caused the first murder in, in the garden, or in, out of the garden. Caused the first murder, didn't it? Because of the jealousy in the brothers over God accepting that which was of what? Blood. Amen? So I know it's quiet in here, but it's okay. And so it's all right. Anyway. And so the Passover lamb sacrificed, okay? It was, it, it's like the Passover lamb that was sacrificed, and God began to say this. Isaiah 31, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Think about it. We need to think about the things that we say and do that are hindering us in our marriages. Amen. Psalm 104, 1 and 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, Lord my God, thou art very great. He says, Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covers thyself with light as with a garment. And I believe that's what was on Adam and Eve. The glory light of God was on them. And, and so the covering of God is the spirit of truth. 
Psalm 8, 4 and 5 says, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and majesty. That is your covering in your marriage. It should be that of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So tradition, this is what he spoke to me uh, yesterday. Tradition has taught us that a man is the covering for his wife. And this is what God said. It has kept women in places of bondage and limitations in Jesus Christ. It has put a spiritual lid on them, which has produced rebellion and bitterness within the marriage, unfulfillment, and women will also feel, or men will also feel pressure and anxiety taking on a responsibility that God did not intend you to have. I'm telling you, I know this is, I feel it, but it is truth. It will liberate you in a healthy way, not in a, not in a control, a domination, all that stuff. No, not in being uh, unsubmitted. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this term that we use. And so even the word cover means to, to, be, to be or serve as a covering, extend over. To rest upon. It means to place something over or upon, upon something. Conceal them. It also means protection. Okay? To provide with a top. Put a lid on something. I want you to think about it. And I found out too what it does. It handicaps women into putting all the pressure on the man. And I'm telling you, that's a lot of pressure. And, and, and so if, if things aren't going right, I hear it all the time when we counsel, uh, women will say, well, if, if my husband would just obey God, I could do what I'm supposed to do. Or if my husband would just do this, or if my husband would just do that. I'm like, you're missing it. Because as much as a couple has a purpose together, okay, we have a calling together, but I also have a purpose with gifts and anointings and a function of God, okay, that I have to fulfill. And so I used to say to my husband, do you really want me to step out and do what I'm supposed to do? I used to, because I have fear. I was afraid to be what God kept telling me in my heart, okay? I had some internal anxieties over doing some things. And so finally he says, he says, you will not use me as an excuse to disobey God. All right? So when he says, you're not going to use me to do that. He said, so I'm not going to hold you back from what God has called you to do. Amen? Amen. Because in the spirit... Paul said, there is neither male nor female. See, in, in the house, you have the husband, right? You have the wife, you have the kids, you have all those things. You have an order of God. It's beautiful how God made that. But in the spirit, help us, Lord. In the spirit, we try and pull this natural stuff over here, and we don't fulfill our purpose and our destiny. And so you'll see it in churches all over where women are not even allowed in a pulpit. And so all of these cultural things and, and this function that came into the church back in the Bible times, people made doctrines out of that stuff, right? And so I don't want George to try and take Jesus' job. He can't do it. There's one Jesus. You hear me by the spirit, right? But do you see, because our words have so much power, and if we really believe that we can protect them from evil, our prayers have power, but our prayers are moved and fueled by what? The spirit of God and faith. That's what makes our prayers work, is faith, right? And so in 2 Timothy 2.13, God even said, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And so 
you know, in the beginning, before and after the fall, you know, male and female, spiritual coverings was the Lord's responsibility. So I'm trying to help you because I hear that all the time in church. I hear it all the time, and it is, it is the Lord's responsibility. And so they clearly could not cover each other. It was a failed attempt because God had to step in and do it. And so thank God that he's helping us. We're going to change some verbiage out of our mouth. Amen. We're going to realize that, you know what? I can trust God with my spouse. <laughs> I can trust God with them. Because the work of the flesh will always want to dominate, control, dictate, intimidate, pride. It will always happen. And so let's go to, let's walk some more word here. Let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 1 and we'll go to Ephesians 5 and all those great scriptures. Amen. That is good. See, we're just trying to bring some healing because it could be. If, if there's some things that are out of order or things that are, you know, scripturally, you believe, when you believe something, you live that. You live it out. If you believe it, you walk in that, right? But when you, when the Bible says, when you know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. First Corinthians 11, we'll go there first. It says, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head, right? Of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. And he says, I should have read too, it says, Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I have delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. And so, and he goes on, and he's, he's dealing with some of their traditions and some of the things that they were saying. And that Greek word there has the meaning of being a source and an origin of supply. It's the same word they use in Ephesians, okay? Now, we know that the body can't go to Ephesians 5. The body can't even function without a head, right? Naturally. So Ephesians 5, and some of you may, may um, already have an understanding of these things, but I'm telling you, some of this is news to some ears. In Ephesians 5, 22, it says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head. That's the same word that they use in 1 Corinthians, and it says, of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So there should be an openness, a unity. There should be a a peace. There should you should be a, a able to be naked and unshamed. Amen. And so that word head there, it says Christ is, if I put it in the terms that when you look it up, Christ is the sustainer. Christ is the source and nurturer of the church. Is he not? Amen. Yes, he is. So should the husband be to the wife. Amen? Sustainer. He should, he should be as Christ is to the church. And it goes, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So there, there is a washing that comes from being nurtured and, and, and spoke uh, Correctly to and nurtured and honored by what? The word of God and understanding. It needs to happen. So you'll find this weekend that there's a lot of things that echo in your mind. Probably some word curses and some things maybe that were spoken in anger. Things that you have maybe lashed out or some areas where you've struggled and you failed your mate. We need God to heal those things and uproot those areas this weekend. 
You know, it could be that some, it's something that it probably is some kind of trauma, something that has happened from seasons past, maybe a hard place that you've been in, maybe an area of struggle, whatever it is. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to show you what it is. What area in your marriage that doesn't look like Jesus? What place in your marriage is broken? What is out of order in your marriage? You need to allow the Holy Spirit to shine a light on it because he will do it. If you're open and honest, all right, he will show you what that is. And see, God is a supernatural God. <laughs> That means that even though, you know, you're sitting here, we're reading scriptures, we're you know, teaching, but I'm telling you, he is a supernatural God, and he can go into those places and fix some breaches. Amen. Amen. I see him do it all the time. It's so different with marriages. And so it said, husbands, you're to love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a tall order, isn't it? Husbands, that's tall right there. <laughs> And he says, so that he might sanctify her, cleansing her with the washing of water with the word. And then it says, so husbands are also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. See, that's a powerful scripture. But, you know, when you're dealing with people that have all this self-hatred and self-rejection, it's really difficult for someone that has those things in them and they're battling and they're struggling with those areas because what's on the inside Whatever you have, because because men give something to the wife. We know that. We know how it works, biology, right? And she takes it in, and she creates something and gives it back. So whatever you give her to nurture, she's going to give it back to you. Whatever it is, because that is how God made us. And so you think about, you know, people are broken, People are angry. People have unforgiveness and all of these things going on within the union, within that covenant relationship. And when that stuff is working, it's, it's going in and coming back. It's going in and what? It's coming back. And that's what continues to happen until we allow God to deal with it. But you have to be open and honest and transparent for God to heal it. Because if you hide it and if you bury it, he's not going to touch it. Amen. Right? So do you trust him or not? Yeah. Amen. 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 He said, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does in church. And so when, when I've been in a traumatic relationship or if I've been broken or traumatized by my mate, you know, if I don't get some healing oil down in those places and I don't forgive and get some healing oil... There's not going to be any of this stuff we're reading about right here. There's not going to be cherishing anymore. And like I say, the enemy, there's always going to be demonic attacks on marriage. Okay, you can, you can drink it. It's going to happen. And it's going, to take some, it's going to take some work to keep it alive and healthy in Jesus' name. And so he says, because we are members of his body... And so he quotes, he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and two shall become one. So there is one flesh there. He says this mystery is great. And that word mystery actually means secret. It is great. He said, But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And nevertheless, he said, Each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So there is an exchange that is always going on that should be healthy within marriage, right? And so we need to deal with it, with the places this weekend. So what I need you to do is to do some journaling, do some writing, some areas where you know you need some work. Because I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is going to deal with some things. Because I find that, you know, words are legal in the realm of the spirit. There's, there's words that produce these spiritual contracts, things we say in uh, anger, things that we've done to break covenant with our mouth. And so we see it all the time where couples uncover the other one. And they, they don't do it as, you know, natural. They do it with this right here where they expose and uncover their mate. And I, I teach our people and I tell them it's one thing, you know, to get counsel. Counsel is, okay, from mature people. 
to get a resolve or a solution from Jesus. But I find that people take their business to their friends and they take their marriage business to this or even a big no, taking it to their children. And so you have all this dysfunction and out of balance where you have adult children can, be, can take the place of a spouse. It's true. You may never be uh, intimate with them in incest, but you have been that way emotionally. You've put your adult children in a place that they should not be. That needs to be fixed. And then we wonder why adult children don't want to get married. Well, what model have they seen? Right? What have they seen us model? You should never, ever expose your mate. You should never do that. You should cover them in prayer, okay? And you should you should take it to who? The Lord. Or to someone that can, you know, help you with it if you need counsel. But you find it especially with, you know, we see a lot, you know, with women going to their friends and trying to get, you know, help or whatever that is. And I'm telling you, you're creating more warfare. You're creating so much more warfare for your marriage. And you should never share your intimacy with anybody. A lot of younger couples will do that, and, and we've had to counsel them where they'll, they'll share all their business. That's wrong to do that. Don't let anybody in your marriage bed. Don't let anybody in there. Don't let them in there. Don't let them know your business. And you see a lot of that today. You know, uh, social media and all this stuff that people use. Warfare. Warfare. You put it out there, demons will come. They will come. Demonic traffic, the wind creatures carry things. And so I'm telling you, it will come back to get you. And so those are the kind of things. And your your intimacy, even even your own, um, your, your bedroom should be a place that is kept private. I know we raised six kids. They just knew they didn't go in there. Very seldom. The kids would come in there, you know, maybe jump on the bed, whatever. They were out the door. And so that is not a place where uh, you're counseling people. That is not a place where you are fighting. People say, well, let's go, we're going to go to the bedroom. We're going to fight to get away from the kids. I'm telling you, you're contaminating your sanctuary. That's supposed to be an intimate, private place between a husband and a wife. It should be kept that way. And so you need to set some, some of you need to set some boundaries if you have a lot of uh, children or a lot of traffic going on and and some people that, you know, taking phone calls all hours of the night, you know, interruption in there. You know what I'm saying? From, from the sleep and all those things. I'm telling you, I'm trying to help you in that area. Because God is like, you need to keep that place holy. You know, your mate is the only person God allows you to worship or to be intimate with like that. You know that, right? It shouldn't be a best friend. It shouldn't be anybody but your spouse, your covenant partner. There should be something special and intimate that nobody else can get in. So there should be some privacy and some respect in these areas. Never put your spouse's business out there. And so there's some in here that have had that happen, where they have said things that you shouldn't have said. You've done some things you shouldn't have done. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, right? Thank God there is a washing of the blood of Jesus. And so, you know, just like it's no different than uh, young people growing up in, in public school system, and they have to say this and say that to fit in and whatever. And they, you know, we, we have to do better. Right? We have to have some integrity in our relationships with our spouses. If we want respect, we have to what? Give it. We, we have to begin to give those things because if we don't, it's going to continue to bring traffic and demonic traffic into our marriage. And the enemy is always watching. Every marriage, there are, there are watcher spirits that are assigned to you, whether you think they're there or not. They are watching. And they are assigned to this covenant to break it up. Truth. Because the devil hates marriage. And then he hates it. And so thank God for Jesus, right? Amen. Amen.
Philippians, serving one another. What happens when, you know, when you get married and it seems like, you know, people say all the time, well, it's just fizzled out. I don't feel this and I don't feel that. And, you know, and, and he doesn't do what he used to do and she doesn't say what she used to say. And why do we let that go away? Why do we let time? See, time should enhance it, right? Time should make it better. You go to Philippians. There should be a serving that happens. There's a law of sowing and reaping, and it works even with our mate, with our spouse. And so in Philippians, because it's the marriage is supposed to look like Christ in the church, Philippians chapter 2, it says... In verse 3, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. He said, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. He says, Do not merely look on, he said, Look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. He said, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. When's the last time you emptied yourself on your spouse? Amen. Mm. Taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. And so because of the humility of Christ and because of his servant attitude, it says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, he said, of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And so, you know, he's talking about, we say that we are to be, our marriage should emulate or look like Jesus, right? And so that means that I have to take on the nature of a servant with my spouse. Mm -hmm. See, every marriage has a way it function. Every house is different, right? But even if it's different, it still should have the nature and character of Jesus in it. it should, he should be woven in that. And so what, if, if you want something out of your spouse because you're one, you want something out of them, you know what you have to do? Give them what you desire. It's called being selfless. <laughs> you have to give them that which you want. You ever try and outserve your mate? Most of that is foreign today in marriages. Most of the time, it's you serve me, right? But that's not the intention of God. The intention of God was to become like Jesus within a marriage. And so your marriage reflects your relationship that you have with the Lord. Something to think about, right? It reflects that. That's what it says. So thank God he's going to do some healing and some restoration in the house this weekend. And so we don't have to question if he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Because he's all about doing that. He is all about doing it. And so in a mature marriage, as the man is head after the pattern of Jesus, okay, he will support and lift his wife up to his own level of authority or equality or oneness. Because it says that God... And Jesus were what? One. The Father and Jesus were one. He said he didn't even, he said he didn't think equality to be like God was something to be what? Grasped. And so there was a humility. Even though he knew who he was, there was a humility that he walked in. Amen. And he released authority to us. And so the influence or the headship is won by self-sacrificing. A self-sacrificing of love, which is how Christ won his church. He didn't win you over by controlling you. He said, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Right? Not with sarcasm and hatred and anger. I'm sorry, but that, that didn't work. Did it? But with his love, he drew me. And it was a selfless love. 
And so he didn't draw us by ruling the bending. No, he didn't. All of that is a work of the flesh. And there's a lot of that that goes on in uh, Christian marriages today. There's a lot of, uh, we call it charismatic witchcraft, manipulation. People will manipulate to get what they want, dominate, intimidate. All of those things are a work of the flesh and that spiritual witchcraft. And it functions in marriages, in the church. And it must be, uh, you must identify and see it and come out of agreement with it. If you want to walk like Christ, if you want your marriage to look like Jesus, then you have to do it. You have to recognize that you do manipulate. You do lie. You do dominate. You do control with anger. Your wife should not be afraid to come home when you've had a bad day. The children shouldn't uh, walk on eggshells because dad's, have, dad's had a bad day. Or mom. Right? And there's a lot of that, too, that goes on. It doesn't matter either way. But it shouldn't be like that. There should be an atmosphere in your house. If you say you're a godly a couple and, and Christ is at the center, there should be an atmosphere of Jesus within my house. Mm -hmm. There should be no fear because what? Perfect love casts out fear. So there should be no fear of intimacy. There should be no fear of being vulnerable. But so many times we'll find where uh, a husband or a wife has belittled or has poked fun of or, or ridiculed or been uh, angry, lost tempers uh, with their mate or with their spouse. And then we find that what? There's dysfunction in there because the people have not been healed. They're still living in the past, a past trauma and pain. But God can heal it and he can free you of it in Jesus' name. But you have to have a desire. You have to have a desire. If, if, if two people desire to be whole, Jesus will bring wholeness within them. And he'll heal the marriages and the breaches. He can do it. And then if you find in here and you, you have a spouse that is not saved, your prayers of faith can save him or her. It can happen. And we can stand in agreement for that even this weekend for spouses that are not born again and believe God to, to move mightily in those areas. Amen. So we need to see that happen. Let's go to 1 Peter 3. I'm almost through. 1 Peter 3, 7. He says, husbands, in the same way, he said, live with your wives in an understanding way. That means that I'm patient, right? As with someone weaker, and that weaker means it, it denotes physically, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of, of the grace of life so that your prayers will be not hindered. So he's saying that she is a fellow heir with you. Okay, in the grace of life, he says, you, you need to do these things so that your prayers are not hindered. And so we know that unforgiveness toward our mate will hinder our prayers toward them or for them. If I have unforgiveness toward my husband and I'm trying to pray for him, you know, to come out of an area of struggle or bondage, the unforgiveness that I have for him keeps him snared in his sin. Unforgiveness is a wicked spirit, a spirit of offense, okay? And so, and it's going to boomerang and come back around again, and I continue to have unforgiveness and be angry. I'm keeping him yoked. My unforgiveness keeps him yoked or um, her yoked, however that goes, okay? And so it will hinder the prayers. And so will not honoring her as a fellow heir of grace. So to sum it up, he said, all of you be harmonious. He's talking about marriage. Be harmonious. Be sympathetic. Okay? Brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. Now, that's a challenge, living with someone every day, right, that maybe spews out insults. But you know how you can love the unlovely? By the power of God. By the Holy Spirit in you. People say, I don't know how to love. Are you saved? <laughs> For real? Because if you have the Spirit of God, you house the love of God. It is your flesh that doesn't want to love people. It's your flesh. 
So you're making excuses, and you're not supposed to make excuses for that. Then he says, to sum up, he said, be harmonious, okay? Be sensitive, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. And then he says, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So he's, he's speaking of this calling, this great gift and blessing of marriage. He's like, he's like, there's an inheritance that he'll release to us. He said, for the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from the evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attended to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so, you, you know, you're looking at that and you're saying, okay, that's a tall order. But by the grace of God and Holy Spirit, we can do it. Amen. And there's many in here that have mastered a lot of things in marriage. You've been married a long time. You need to be pouring into some young married couples. Amen. You need to be helping them. <laughs> if you've walked through some things, you need to be helping them because it is, it is under attack today. And so a husband should honor his wife as being equally with himself an everlasting soul. Wow. It's awesome, isn't it? And so God's going to help you to see the areas where you're struggling in, areas where you want improvement. Right? We all have them. So I want you to do that. I want you to journal some things, some places where you know, and tomorrow we're going to get into some other things. Some deeper things concerning intimacy, concerning uh, demonic traffic, and some stronghold, and some areas, and things that we have been taught that uh, that's allowed the enemy to come in. Because you know, if you don't know better, you can't do better. Amen. Amen. If you don't know, you, you have to know your adversary. You have to know how the enemy works. And so, we have the refreshments for you back there. And, but, I, but I do want us to uh, stand up. We're going to pray.